Okay. Uh, good, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming to this uh, meeting today. Uh, and thank you again for participation in yesterday's meeting. Uh, we'll be talking some real uh, discussion about fraud today. Um, and I hope situation everywhere is getting better. Uh, whatever happening, stay positive and stay home. Stay aware of your circumstances. It is a situation that we're facing that is uh, unprecedented in the history of uh, civilization. So we have to uh, be careful and probably this is going to be a new norm. Uh, without much ado, let's start the discussion. Uh, today's discussion is going to be about um, it's going to be about introduction to fraud, but we will talk about fraud mostly. I will not talk about myself anymore. We have done that yesterday. Main topic today is why people commit fraud. That's what we are going to learn today. So we will learn how to recognize, recognize who commits fraud, understand why people commit fraud, become familiar with the fraud triangle. That's the most important uh, aspect of the whole training. Understand how pressure contributes to fraud. Know why opportunities must be present in order for fraud to be committed. About today's discussion, I want to really highlight fraud fighting is about a mindset. It's not about knowledge only. It's about mindset. So from going forward, if you have the right mindset, you will be able to discover fraud much more easily. Okay. So again, I would say that uh, at the end of the meeting, we hope that we will be able to do that, that change your mindset about what is happening. We'll also learn about identifying controls that prevent or detect fraudulent behavior, identify non-control factors that provide opportunities for fraud, and understand why people rationalize their fraudulent activities. Now, what does a fraudster look like? You must be thinking, okay, all this research that happened so is there any way we can profile a fraudster? Well, here it is. They are just like you and me. There's no special look of a fraudster that you can identify that, oh, this guy is a fraud. There are no specific psychological profile. A person who is normal today may be committing fraud tomorrow. A person who has never done anything wrong in their life, very religious person, you may find him doing a major fraud uh, next day. 70% of the fraudster are male, while female make 30%. And females are 2% of the property often, we'll talk about it later. But it doesn't mean that male are more prone to fraud and the women are not. It's probably because of the work composition in the, 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 the composition in the workplace. One second. They are usually older people, younger people, they tend to commit fraud less. It's probably that they don't understand the system that well. As they get older, they understand the system better. And there are other incentives that we'll talk about later that contributes to uh, people being fraud at the older age. They are more religious. This is very, very interesting. You were talking about Barney Ebers in uh, um, WorldCom. He was a, he is a very, very religious person. He was donating a lot to the charities and, the, and in the churches. He was well known in the community for promoting religion and being religious and uh, donating to religious charities. So was Barney Madoff. So was most of the people that we know. They don't tend to do substance abuse. That means they are not really a drug addict. 
or uh, tech people. So drug addicts, they do other kind, but not the fraud really. Those who commit fraud, they are usually pretty decent people. Describe the profile of fraud perpetrators, okay? These are college students. Most of the fraud perpetrators, they have college education. And then there are some there, you know, property offender like burglars and robbers. They usually don't have that much education. There are three elements that are common in every fraud. Okay, by the way, just to let you know, if you want to speak while um, I am, or you have any question, you can, I think, press the space button and your uh, mute will turn off temporarily and you can speak also, okay? And time to time during the discussion, I will stop and ask for a question. And if you have any question, uh, this is a very strange telephone number. Okay. Uh, you have a strange question, uh, um, uh, any question, then you can ask them me yeah, at that time. The three elements that is common in every fraud are, there is a perceived pressure, perceived opportunity, and the rationalization. So these three combined creates the ground for somebody to commit fraud. We'll discuss more about it in the coming slides. So these elements, this particular three, the triangle formation you're looking at, this is known as the fraud triangle. This is one of the most common thing that you will see any kind of fraud discussion. And I suggest, I mean, I, it, if you want to fight fraud, this fraud triangle must be etched into your mind permanently, okay? You should never forget, you should have complete understanding and you should be able to tell anybody ask you what are the three elements of fraud or what is a fraud triangle you should be able to say that is pressure opportunity and rationalization now define the following right what is perceived pressure perceived pressure is a situation where someone believes that they have a, have a need to commit a fraud Okay, they, they have a need to commit fraud. Now, everybody, you, those who are familiar with investigating uh, fraud incidents, they will know, they will tell you that these are our people, um, they have family problem or other financial problem. Um, these are, I'm talking about general scenario. There are some exceptions, we'll talk about it later. Also to meet the targets normally in the corporate. Yeah, that will come. Yeah, exactly. Those will come. So those are the usually, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, pressure, they call it, to commit fraud. Then the passive opportunity. There has to be a situation where someone believes they have a favorable or promising combination of circumstances to commit an undetectable fraud. We'll talk about it later in an undetectable, why the word undetectable undetec comes in. That is, under the opportunity comes the understanding of the business. Those who have done major fraud, they usually have a very good understanding of the business process. Without having an understanding of the business process, it's very difficult to commit fraud. You'll get caught right away. So these are very smart people. That's why one of the reasons that you have older people doing the fraud, in my opinion, is because it takes time to understand the business process. There are very few who can do it right away. I have seen some cases that the, it happened instantaneously. Somebody was counting money and uh, accidentally the depositor uh, gave more money than he should have. And this individual was so quick to uh, identify that discrepancy and immediately pocket the extra money. That was unbelievable. I have not seen anybody. I mean, this guy's a mathematical genius. 
But anyway, it got caught in the camera. Um, so you have to have the opportunity. That is, you have to have a good understanding of the controls, business processes, and the circumstances. And you have to have the confidence that whatever you're going to do, whatever you're going to do, is not going to be detected. If you know somebody is going to detect it, you're not going to do the fraud. So it is very, very important that that perception is there, that it is undetectable. Then there comes the final element, the rationalization. For someone to commit fraud, they have to be able to rationalize their action. They know it is wrong. They know it is wrong. But for them to do it, they have to make them believe that it is right. They have to be able to rationalize it. It could be, oh, I'm not getting paid enough. In my position, other companies are paying 20% more. So I'm just making up for the differences. So there are many ways to rationalize it. That element, it has to be there. Now, all these three components has to be present, but they don't have to be present in the same proportion. We'll go to the next slide. It is like for fire to happen, for anywhere the fire to happen, the three elements must be present. Heat, there has to be a source of heat, there has to be a source for oxygen, and there has to be a fuel. Combine these three, then you have a fire situation. Now, to extinguish fire, we have to remove one of these three elements. If you remove one of these three elements, it will, fire will not happen. Similarly, for fraud, if you want to remove the, the environment for fraud, you have to be able to remove one of these elements. If you remove the pressure, fraud will not happen. If you remove um, the opportunities, fraud will not happen. If you remove the rationalization, fraud will not happen. But how to do it, we'll talk about it in the next few days. So when we go for investigation or examination or fraud examination, we are basically looking for these three elements. And we are trying to see who has the most, possible, the highest probability of having these three elements present. So those are our suspects. And then from a prevention point of view, we want to identify those scenarios and see if we can put controls in place to prevent fraud. Any question as of now? Okay, I'll, I'll uh, move forward. Again, as I told you, the pressure, rationalization, perceived opportunity, they don't need to be present in the same proportion but they need to be present at, to some extent. So it's not a 33% perceived pressure, 34% <laughs> rationalization, and perceived 33% perceived opportunity. Only then there will be fraud. It's not the case. They will be present to some extent. One will be more than the other, but they need to be present. That's usually the most cases. There are exceptions. We'll talk about the exceptions later. Now, <clears throat> There is another theory that out there about personal integrity. What is the effect of personal integrity over fraud? If somebody, whether somebody commits fraud or not, uh, how personal integrity affects that? It, usually, this is, uh, came out of research that higher the personal integrity, the less likely to commit fraud. So even all those three elements are present, if one's personal integrity is very high, they will not move forward with the fraud. Okay. Even all those three elements are present, a person, person with high integrity, they will not commit fraud. 
for them it will take much more than the three fraud elements to move them to commit fraud but there are many fraud studies happening recently and it shows that in general people's personal integrity and honesty levels are decreasing there are studies done in colleges among the college student in america and the question of personal integrity was asked like what will take them to commit fraud and um, whether you know it is okay uh, to take bribe or do corruption or if the opportunity arises to take money almost 56% or something like that said that yes if they have the opportunity like that they will do it and it is okay so uh, that's alarming that only shows that the incidence of fraud is going to go up in the future not going to go down um because uh, somehow we are losing our integrity level and we have to instill that integrity in our uh, young population that we have to keep in mind now what are the four types of pressures okay one of the pressure is financial pressure i will talk about each of these types in detail another is work related pressure especially what i'm hearing nowadays uh, a lot of people working from home and the workload is simply uh, unbelievable i'm getting complaint that what they used to do in 3 months they've been asked to do in 3 weeks um vices addiction gambling and uh, those type of things and there are other pressure we'll talk about it one by one first element of pressure financial so 95% all of all fraud are either financial or vice related so all of them had a perceived need for financial gain or they are involved in gambling or other activities that required huge amount of financial infusion which they did not have from their regular sources and that motivated them to commit fraud list of some common pressure one is greed you are dealing with cash millions of dollar cash every day then you're taking it to the bank and uh, you're doing it every day and some people might think well um, why don't you just take a one day and just go and nobody's going to find me that's greed living beyond your means <clears throat> i have a scenario one guy he was a uh lexus sales person and um he just joined and he started coming to um the uh, work driving a bentley nobody questioned the where he is getting a bentley from his salary that was not $2000 the bentley rent alone is about $5000 per day and later on we found out that he was taking cash from the customer and he was pocketing it and having a good life um high bills of personal debt and especially in america it happens a lot that when there are medical situation the family one of the family members are, uh got into a medical emergency and that required huge amount of um expenses sometime we have seen those people are uh, getting into the fraud fraudulent activities not necessarily it doesn't mean everybody there are some ex exceptions that we have seen uh doing that poor credit that you don't have the good credit rating you cannot get money you have damaged your credit rating over the years and you need more money to maintain your personal lifestyle or whatever and those people who commit fraud personal financial losses they might have invested in um something that was beyond their risk uh, uh level 
Um, and now they're trying to cover the loss. <coughs> Excuse me. And unexpected financial needs. That can happen from any, any circumstances. Then what is the next one? The work-related pressure. So common examples are job dissatisfaction, that the whatever work we are doing, you're not happy with it for whatever reason. Little recognition of, from, of job performance. Uh, we have seen a case, one of the reason, uh, the one, the one of the company I work where um, the final, the, the reason they set up the forensic department was because there was one uh, finance manager. Um, she felt that she was not, um, I think she was passed on uh, promotion um, and she was very upset. So she basically, um, defraud the company almost $7 million over one year period. And when it was found out, um, basically she said that, you know, I just wanted to teach a lesson to the finance manager that, you know, I'm better than him. Uh, good thing is that that lady did not spend that money. She kept it in one separate account and she was able to reimburse the whole amount. Um, Fear of losing one's job, especially uh, nowadays. Just, uh, yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, uh, what, what eventually happened to that lady? Uh, I will not discuss that. There, there are some other issues, okay? Because if I discuss that, it will disclose where, where she's from. <laughs> okay, of course, of course. Okay. Um, anyway, um, the, the, okay. Fear of losing one's job, especially knowing the circumstances we are in, especially in the Middle East, not in the Middle East now, now it's globally. A lot of people are at risk of losing their jobs and the petty fraud will increase. Obviously they know they're gonna lose their job. So they will try to maximize, especially those who are already doing it. They will try to maximize whatever they can in the next few days or next few months, okay. Um, being overlooked for a promotion, as I told you the example, um, and feeling underpaid, that happened a lot, that you think that you're not paid enough, and uh, that motivates them to commit fraud and rationalize it that, oh, I'm not getting paid, so this is the difference of my uh, shortfall. So other pressure, spouse who insist on a improved lifestyle. I hope none of us are having that experience. Um, a challenge to beat the system. Ah, these are the interesting thing. There are certain people, their nature of pressure is they just want to challenge, they just want to beat the system. They have no other motivation. Especially okay. financial statement fraud and like yeah, no, no, no. Financial statement from there is a motivation. There is a yeah. pressure because management wants better performance. There are certain people, they just want to beat the system. No other motivation. Okay, especially hackers. Sometimes they hack only to hack, not because they are really want to any personal gain. They, that comes with it, but they just want to challenge the system. They just want to prove that you can, they can do it. Okay, and need to appear successful. That is, you know, my income is not enough to get me a Mercedes, but uh, without a Mercedes, my, my family members, my friends are driving it. So, you know, I don't, I look like a loser. So I need to get that extra money from somehow to look successful. Now, the second element, which is perceived opportunity. Again, here we need to have it good understanding of the business. Now, what are the three elements, components of perceived opportunity? There are three things that needs to be present in an, for an opportunity to really look enticing. There is opportunity to commit fraud, opportunity 
to conceal fraud, opportunity to avoid punishment. Very, very important. Opportunity to commit fraud. That means they need to have a very good understanding of the, there should be a control gap somewhere, okay, that they can exploit. And that control gaps will also allow them to conceal the fraud. If they don't, if they are not, if they think that they cannot conceal the fraud, they will not do the fraud. Remember that. Nobody is going to commit fraud knowing that I'm going to get caught. And to avoid punishment. This is one thing most companies um, don't realize that they need to be very consistent on punishing people. But I have seen companies where punishment is based on nationality, punishment is based on relationship. Those are very ineffective. Okay. Those are very ineffective. If you want to punish, you should not look into the color, nationality, sex, nothing. It should be very clear and consistent. And if you're not able to do that, better not have a investigation department. Just give them a you know, warning and move on. Uh, but I have seen many organizations not having that consistent approach. <clears throat> Any question here? Okay, I'll move on. Uh, Shri, can you please give an example of uh, how to conceal fraud? Conce no, it's, it's not an example. Uh, when you have, for example, if there is no um, proper checks and balances, I'll give you an, okay, I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was in uh, one of the telecom operator and um, there, see the, the SIM card, the good numbers, you know, good numbers, numbers ending with 0001 or something like that, easy to remember. They are in a very high demand. Sometimes a good number can sell for uh, close to a million dollars. Okay. So uh, the activation of the good number, the manager, he was a little bit lazy. So what he did, he gave this poor uh, salesperson whose salary is not even $1,000 to do the activation authority. So he gave his password to him to do the activation. Okay. And this particular salesperson was working there for a long time. So he understood the process. He understood everything. And what he did one fine morning for three years, he was a very honest guy. He did not do anything wrong. He was activating all these good number. He knew where the good numbers are kept. These are not kept everywhere. These are usually kept in a vault and he had access to the vault also. So what he did that he figured out that he, he, he found customers who are willing to buy the good numbers from him. And he got those good numbers out, <clears throat> activated those numbers. He knows that by the time the activation happens, he has only 24 hours in the, uh, before he can get detected because good numbers, when you activate it, there's an alarm comes to us. And he had all the um, tickets and everything ready. He took the number, activated those, delivered it to the guy, and immediately took the flight out of the country. Okay, it was close to uh, um, total, I think involved was about a million dollars. I think more than a million dollars. Okay, he took it out. And the way he concealed it, is, as you told you, he knew he's not gonna get caught for 24 hours. By that time he will fly. It, by the time he flies. He knew the con he knew that period of concealment and that's his window. He knew the process very well. Okay. <clears throat> so that's, that's one of the things that we have. Uh, here's not a question of avoiding punishment because that's why he ran away. 
Uh, it was more a question of control and uh, the opportunity. He should have ne never have that access to activate those good numbers. Yeah, dual person should be involved. Yeah, I mean, uh, we found out, but again, um, there the avoiding punishment thing comes at again in the story, but I will not discuss that, okay? <laughs> A lot of things I will not be able to discuss too uh, openly because of the confidentiality involved in the uh, about the company and the, uh, the the my past employers. Okay. List of major factors that increase opportunity to commit fraud. <clears throat> lack of circumventing, lack of or circum. Uh, circumvention of internal controls that prevent or detect fraud. Okay, sometimes the controls are not there. For example, I was working for a company and we found out there's a lot of issue with petty cash. But then we found out when we started uh, investigating those cases, we found out that nobody even was looking and checking the petty cash reimbursement. And the finance department was completely oblivious to those uh, reimbursements. So there was no checks and balance. They didn't even have a policy to dictate the petty cash. And there were millions of dollars petty cash uh, being transacted. Uh, excuse everywhere. me, there is some noise coming over somewhere. Okay, um, let me close it down. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. No, no, thank you very much. Shukriya. Uh, let me see which one is mute. Okay. Uh, let me see if anybody else is on mute. When you want to speak, just press the, I think the your button, uh, the space bar. I think you should be able to speak, okay? Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much for your uh, pointing it out. So there has to be lack of controls or circumventing controls uh, to prevent or detect fraud, like your checks and balance or um, uh, uh, you know, uh, bank reconciliation. Nowadays, a lot of these things are automated. But again, I know in one time, um, I was auditing one of the largest uh, city corporation in America. And when we were looking into the, one of the agencies, petty cash, no, no, the re bank reconciliation, we realized that they never did bank reconciliation. What they were doing when the auditors will come, they'll do bank reconciliation only then, sign on that one day and give it to auditors and auditors walks out. So we found out that we a big issue and we, we got that fixed, okay? Inability to judge quality of performance. Here the experience comes. If you have somebody who does not know what is the right quality, especially in the construction business, if you have a new guy who has no experience about the quality of the wood, the quality of the materials, then they will not be able to judge what they are doing, what material being delivered. Failure to discipline fraud perpetrator. This is one of the most critical. I would say if you cannot do that, don't get into a fraud investigation. Okay, you will just waste your time because when somebody sees that people can get away doing murder or stealing money, then all your efforts, all your controls will fall apart. So before Anybody ask you to do investigation, make sure that your management is ready for the, for the outcome. If the management is not ready for the outcome, you better just do internal audit, give some control recommendation and walk out. Don't waste your time because investigation is a very, very uh, stressful job. It is not easy. Um, I, I know myself, the day I have investigation, that day I don't keep any other work with me. Okay, because it's very, very stressful. At the end of the day, I'm completely drained. Uh, not to mention the other, other party. <clears throat> oh, 
okay lack of access to information like nowadays most companies they have erp system so you have information that you can get about the transactions who is doing it when they did it but there are a lot of companies i know they don't have any um uh, they don't have proper information system so they don't have the information they need to investigate uh, these are these are manual in documents sometimes is missing uh, in those cases your investigation uh, will not be successful in fact the perpetrator they will um, know about it and that's what the that's the opportunity they will take to commit fraud ignorance apathy uh, incapacity this can come also if we do not have proper discipline then they will oh, one second let me see who where the noise is noise is coming from okay okay um so they know um they don't care they have seen it so many times happening they have reported it so many times nobody care so they become uh you know i don't care what happened as long as i get my salary i'm okay so this usually in my opinion in my experience is a contribution of the management that one at the top we'll talk about it uh, tomorrow's class lack of audit trail again when you have manual documents then you don't have proper audit trail okay um sometimes i've seen the auditors they just go in as i told you the petty cash case they saw all these transaction every year during the audit and they saw the everything is signed amount is there uh dates are there there is a uh, proper invoice and they said everything is fine when i went in my team went in and we looked at the same document i told them start comparing where we are getting most of the transaction uh, purchases from is it handwritten if it is handwritten compare the handwriting from different invoices and we found out that all are handwritten invoices then i told my team to go check with the vendor get the vendor copy of the invoice and when we got the vendor copy we found out that it was a blank sheet basically the vendor was giving them a copy of the invoice so they can handwrite whatever they want and these guys were charging more than almost sometimes 100% more than the market price of the items they are uh, uh, getting reimbursed for okay so let's do some uh, uh, matching terms the control environment usually is a set of characteristics that defines good management control features other than accounting policy and procedures uh somebody is getting logged on in and out a lot it seems like um any questions you have any any other questions okay now we'll talk about the control environment here is, this is another good thing i need to talk about again control environment it is not only accounting policy and procedures it's a good management you know management setting the right tone at the top this is very very critical if you don't have that no fraud measure will be effective <clears throat> so we'll go to that what is a control environment there has to be a good role modeling role modeling means the management must set example that they are not going to be um uh, interfering in your investigation uh, outcome i excuse me let me there's some noise still noise coming out i don't know can you, can you please mute the sharif hosen mic sharif hosen hey, that is on, that is mute already Okay, uh, but let me see. Uh, okay. 
everything is mute but i, I can see got that uh, got i got can got see the sharif hussein is mic is not mute sharif hussein sharif hussein uh, okay uh, okay got it yeah now mute okay okay i hope you guys like my background it looks like i'm in a caribbean ocean yeah this is a new feature of a uh, zoom i thought i will try it to give you guys a little bit of a refreshing background view okay okay it's good um we want to keep ourselves motivated positive whatever it is imagination okay sure uh, there is a small question yeah this was my um you know you you talked about different measures that we should always have that the fraud is you know not disciplined uh then especially within companies uh, this might actually lead to it recurring so what kind of measures are you know like standard like that uh, uh, can you can you i your your uh, voice is echoing can you just close come close to the mic and state it uh, slowly <coughs> excuse me uh should be this better yeah yes but now okay uh, so i said that um, you know we said that there was some control measures that you know our auditor should always have before going into uh, investigating fraud so what are the best case uh, you know audit measures you should have within a company uh, to ensure that when a you know a control department comes in or a fraud invest for the investigator comes in that should be in place or someone should request from the management okay no you okay here is a good thing yesterday i asked a question about uh, what is the best practice in uh, setting up a fraud investigation department um, i i at that time i mentioned there are no best practice as for the how it is set up but there is a requirement that fraud investigation team should have independence so a lot of the time in my opinion the ideal setting should be whatever function uh is doing it they should have be they should be independent from the management that means like either on the audit committee they should report to the audit committee or some other independent function um i have worked situation where i reported to the company ceo uh that was wrong because a lot of the outcomes i had that was not um something management wanted to share with anybody okay in that case there is a tendency to hide it um so it is very very important whatever function investigation function is set up they must be under independent um uh, there has to be full independence of the function uh in america i know it is under the legal department because they are much more independent than others um i've seen cases usually most audit teams are reporting to audit committee that is also a good model um investigation team under uh ceo or cfo is the wrong idea because their interest will be compromised so that is more important than um uh, what we are saying if you have that independence and uh, you have the what we'll talk about now the role modeling and everything then you, that's the right environment your question the answer to it will be to set up the right environment for the investigation team to do this investigation in the right way and the investigation outcome should be respected not interfered with that is the answer okay i will talk it about right it more to be under compliance department excuse me again uh, as long the reporting line is independent it doesn't matter okay. <coughs> excuse me the reporting line has to be independent if the department is reporting to an operation and you are finding issue with the operation they will try to suppress it okay okay so the reporting line has to be independent and believe me anybody who is doing investigation you cannot be chicken hearted okay okay you have to uh, i would not say head strong but you have to have a very strong moral ethics 
because remember when we investigate and our outcome can damage somebody's career forever so we have to be conscious of what we do and we have to stand by our outcome even if we make mistakes we have to be able to take it also so it's a whole different it's not like an auditor okay uh, you have to, we have to have those who investigate we have to have a very strong uh, moral position otherwise you will not survive okay uh, you will have you will regret your work when you give a recommendation for the same case same recommendation but then you see the management implementing differently then one is getting fired and another is getting promotion that's the environment you don't want i have seen a case in my own life that i have learned the hard way i will never do it again that the person who was key to the fraud was let go okay they were told let go that same person was rehired six months later and i knew that person is going to be rehired and cause the whole company to go down okay so that is very sad i mean after that incident i i basically could not stay with the company anymore yeah but sure Riff, is, yes. sorry to, I mean, i'm just curious i mean how can a company actually fire that person and then rehire that person back knowing that he committed a fraud before i mean what's the objective uh, that's uh, again if i go detail into that um, there are a lot of um, uh, the prejudice involved here. There are a lot of uh, conflict of interest involved here. Okay. Um, Sorry, but I, I think if I can just rephrase the Thai's question, this Thai's question is that, yeah. what do you think would be an effective policy to ensure that something like this would not happen? What would the fraud <laughs> investigator need from his end to ensure that this kind of... This is about, the I said, role modeling. The management must uh, lead by example that they must commit the uh, when i uh, usually um go for a job interview for investigation position if they ask me uh be before i even accept anything i tell them point blank you have to don't hire me just to be a checklist because i may come up with a solution that will be uh, difficult to swallow but you have to be ready to do that okay um so there are companies there are a lot of especially in the family-based companies you will find a lot of conflict of interest and there is sometimes the driver of the owner has more power than the ceo himself mm -hmm. okay okay but if so, that the, is, is is sorry natuka it's the same thing like if that the case if it's not a family-owned business what what is the best approach you know either we set the procedure for even the, at the management level to ensure it's that the, this behavior is not going to happen you have to have a code of conduct some like from a procedure perspective you have to have code of conduct you mm -hmm. have to have conflict of interest <laughs> policy signed you mm -hmm. have to have the recertification process there are certain controls that we'll talk about it in the coming uh, i think tomorrow okay maybe some okay. some of it will come today also so there are certain procedures, but more than the procedures, more than these policies, more than this document is the mindset. Or the, what I'm saying, the role modeling, the word role modeling, the management, the tone at the top. Okay, management has to be consistent. They have to commit that if somebody is doing wrong, that needs to be punished. Okay. Uh, one of the company I worked on, uh, initially when I joined, uh, there are a lot of people who were trying to circumvent me because their internal relationship and so and so. But the CEO, he took a position that any report that comes from me, he will not override that. Okay. And that helped a lot then people realize whatever earlier what used to happen any investigation happened they used to approach him directly because they were somehow related whatever not 
and he used to override. But when I joined, somehow he stopped doing that. And slowly, 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 we build a structure around it. A lot of the decisions were, um, they realized that going to him is not gonna help anymore. And slowly, slowly, we were able to build a structure in it where there were a vetting process and everything to make sure that decisions coming out are consistent and uh, uh, approved at the top level of the management. So it takes time. Okay, this type of thing, uh, sometimes it is not there. Uh, management wants to happen. And then slowly, slowly you have to pay, put in. Fraud is not about, fighting fraud is not always about being the right, being the headstrong. You have to navigate, you have to be diplomatic. Uh, you have to achieve what is right morally for you to work without any uh, uh, you know, uh, negative uh, feeling uh, over a period of time, gradually, incrementally, and keep on pushing it. And we were able to do that. I mean, that was a big change. Again, role modeling comes in, the tone at the top, okay? Thank you for this is good discussion because this is very important what we're discussing now, more than the policies, more than the anything, you will find company with all kinds of policies, but they're not being followed. Okay. Management communication. See again, code of conduct is a very, very critical document and management has to commit to it. If you go to a company like Coca-Cola, GE, I mean, I work for companies like that. And they have so many ways to communicate the, their code of conduct and zero tolerance approach. And that has to happen on a consistent basis, not that on a checklist basis. Uh, when I was in Deloitte, when it comes to sexual harassment training or any kind of training like that, even the managing partner has to attend it. No excuse. It's not only for the employees. Partners and everybody has to attend it. It's a must. Appropriate hiring. This is again, I told you yesterday that HR also should take the fraud training because they are the gatekeeper. If they let one wrong person in through the system, as I told you about the previous company, I, one of the company I worked for, they knew this guy is going to come back and they allowed it to happen because the other interest, the conflict of interest was there. Okay, so that type of HR, weak HR, is very, very bad for organization. HR has to be very, very strong, making sure the right people are getting in only. Clear organization structure. There are organization structure I have seen in my life that was uh, changing every three months. Nobody knew who is reporting to whom. That type of complex structure is very, very um, uh, I think the ideal ground for fraud. I I'll give you one example. In one of the companies I worked for, uh, a person, he was transferred from department A to department B. Department B rejected the transfer, but because there was no clear communication channel between department A and department B or HR, nobody knew that this guy did not come to work for one and a half year. He was getting his salary, he was going on vacation, he was not coming to work. The department A thought he is with department B, department B thought he is with department A. And when they found out about this particular, that also by accident because this guy somehow did not get a bonus and he came to complain about it. <coughs> he should just kept his mouth shut, nobody would have found out. And only then they found out that, well, he doesn't belong to department A, he doesn't belong to department B, now, well, how do you fire somebody who doesn't belong to any department, but he's an employee? Okay, so it was an interesting uh, uh, circumstances because the law requires certain procedures. And for that procedures to happen, there will be at least six months for this guy uh, uh, has to be given proper notice and this and that, proper documentation. So it took us another six months to get rid of this guy. So he got paid for almost two years doing nothing. Um, effective internal audit team and security and loss prevention program. There has to be a good internal audit team, policy and procedure, trained people, 
uh, different policy and procedure, security measures, only then uh, these are the environmental requirement. You need the proper environment. I have worked in companies, the multi-billion dollar company, their uh, sales center did not have, even have a CCTV. Come on, Amy, even a grocery store nowadays have CCTV. So obviously money was going left and right anywhere they want. Usually, now this is an interesting statistic. Usually they say, the one statistic says that in our organization, 30% people are diehard dishonest. And 40% are honest all the time. And 30% are situationally honest. I have another statistic that says the 10% are diehard honest people, no matter what, they will never do anything wrong. Okay, they will not steal money. Another 10%, these are diehard um, dishonest people. No matter how you incentivize them, they will always look for a wrong, wrong way to do things. And then you have the 80% in between. They're basically sitting on the fence, trying to see which way the wind blows. So if you do not do proper investigation and take proper action, these 80% will also will join the 10%. So 90% of your employee will be stealing money from you. So anyway, whichever you cut, 60 to 90% of your employee you have to uh, have controls over, okay? Uh, generally, uh, internal audit detects 20% of the fraud. Uh, globally, it's a global statistics, okay? <clears throat> now, when fighting fraud, one of the good controls globally we have is the survey and Oxley. It also came out of some fraud incident in the 2002. Uh, the Enron, WorldCom, Sunbeam, all happened about the same time. So then the uh, US government put some regulation around it. So Sarban Oxley requires certain things that can be uh, like Maimun and Tai, you asked for about what are the right uh, procedure policies. So Sarban Oxley is a good benchmark for that. So there has to be um, honest ethical conduct, including handling of actual and apparent conflict of interest. So you have to have policy, code of conduct and conflict of interest policies. Um, again, conflict of interest policies, full, fair, accurate, timely, and understandable disclosure. So there should not be anything hiding. Uh, whatever happens should be disclosed. Uh, in one of the company I work for, our fraud measures were disclosed, uh, regularly reported to the uh, audit committee. Compliance with applicable uh, governmental laws, rules, and regulation. And prompt internal reporting of code violation to an appropriate person or persons, or ad persons identified in the code. Now, here is the interesting thing. If a fraud happens today and it is reported six months later, and then it's reported another six months later, by the time we start the investigation, you have lost most of the value. You have to hit it when it's hot. So you have to, a good organization should have a good reporting mechanism and the awareness campaign to make sure that whenever th that to report it sooner than later. And as soon as the incident is reported, that has to be assessed quickly, make a decision whether you want to investigate or not. And that mechanism has to be in place. It's very, very critical for uh, fraud fighting. Okay, so usually hotline, different companies are hotline. Again, in the hotline setup also- there should, there should be a policy. Not only policy, the hotline. And hotline okay. also should be reported in a independent way. A lot of time, like I have worked in a company where when you implemented hotline and we are initially having very difficult time getting anybody reporting anything to us. Yeah, and there should be a policy to keep the name <coughs> secret, I believe. Then only no, people- What we did, what we engaged a third party, uh, I tell you what happened. So when we were doing training in one of the training, uh, one guy raised his hand and he said, can I ask something? I said, what? They're like, uh, you know what? Before you, we had a hotline implemented also. And some of us reported something and that hotline was managed internally. 
and someone reported something and the top management was trying to trace the IP address to get identify who reported it. And because of that, we don't want to report anything. Because we our uh, identity will be disclosed. So what we told them, they know that's not going to happen because what we did, we in, we um, engaged a third party hotline provider that has a very um, secure channel for uh, taking reports and passing on passing it on to us. No way identity of the reporter will be disclosed. We ensured that. Even then, it took us a long time for people to feel comfortable reporting anything to us because of the fear. Remember, this is very important. If we make that mistake, if we once violate the trust of the employees that they reported something and we went after them because of that, no reporting system will work. Accountability for adherence to the code. So if the code is there, the code of conduct, whoever violates it, there has to be accountability for it. There has to be consequence for it. Only because somebody is the manager and gets away is I usually prefer the other way. I would always go after the manager, not the uh, bottom guys. The bottom guy will not do it if the top guy did not allow it. What are three components of every fraud? We talked about it in different ways. Like this is happened. A theft, asset has to be taken. Then it has to be hidden from others. And you have to convert this, whatever you have done into cash so you can enjoy it. If you're not able to convert it, you will not do commit fraud. Why should you commit fraud if you're not able to enjoy it? Right? So you yeah. For three components has to happen. Asset has to be taken. It has to be, you have to be able to conceal it and then convert it into cash so you can enjoy it. Uh, but it's question. true for fraud, it's true for drug, it's true for everybody, drug lord to everybody. Uh, so Sharif, one question. Uh, for the financial statement fraud, there is, uh, uh, it's not like the assets are taken. It's like- We'll uh, get there. Okay. We'll get there. We'll discuss about it, how that is going to happen. Okay. They are going to benefit from it. Assets are taken is kind of like a theft also. It's benefit from it. They get bonus. They get some other uh, uh, benefit from it. Okay. They get stock options. There are many ways they benefit from it. We'll talk about the financial statement fraud. In fact, I have another session, I think on the third week of April uh, on financial statement fraud exclusively. Um, Okay. <clears throat> now, what is a, what does good accounting system do? Recently, I went to um, a textile uh, uh, and uh, garments manufacturing factory. It's almost like a $150 million operation. They're running it by Excel. Okay. Where is the audit trail? If somebody deletes a number, that is gone forever. Nobody, no way management will know what was the right number. No way they can know the right number. What they are basically doing is trusting a number on the people, 100%, you never do that. So whatever system you have to have in a good accounting system, there has to be a good audit trail. Every transaction, every click has to be recorded so that we can detect the fraud. What, what I have special, yeah, what, go ahead please. I assume they were having the system, but the senior management stopped them from using that system and they were using Excel sheet. <laughs> and and <laughs> they were saying that you, you it's know, easy to you know what is happening. work and because the that intention. Yeah, I know what is happening. There is no I know it, what is happening. Excel. You know what is, why it is happening. Yeah. Okay. I know why it is happening. I think you know what is, why it is happening. They are, they, they are afraid that um, their numbers will be disclosed for tax purpose. Yeah. They're basically trying to hide it from the tax guy. Yeah. 
Okay. <clears throat> so in, the, in that process, they're opening the door to everybody else. Okay. It's a very short-sighted approach, but most management, I mean, a lot of the management in the uh, emerging countries, they fail to understand that. Okay. So a good accounting system, it provides validity of the transaction. It requires proper authorization, ensures complete transaction, completion of the transaction, that the transactions are classified properly, reports are done in a correct time period, and the valuations are done properly, as summaries are correct. Okay, now, and each step of this thing, if it is not done right, you can commit fraud. Okay, uh, the timing of it in the revenue recognition, you can manipulate the timing. You can recognize revenue from period that is not uh, in the wrong period. Okay, uh, but there are ways to detect it. We'll talk about it later. Um, okay, what are the five primary controls? <clears throat> Number one, segregation of duties or dual custody. Is it clear? I think most of us are accountants, auditors. Any question here? Okay. Second is system authorization. Authorization should be done in, through the system as much as possible. Independent checks and balance. So somebody should be reviewing the transaction like bank reconciliation, cash reconciliation, cash count. Um, you know, there has to be independent review of the numbers to make sure, do an analytical review, check the numbers from last month to this month, if there are unusual uh, activities. Physical safeguard, the controls are there that things are not stolen from your uh, storage. I have seen storage where uh, all materials are outside because they were like, oh, okay, uh, we don't have space in the storage. That is, there is a lot of bull crap. Uh, when we started uh, writing them off and then they were uh, able to move everything properly in the storage area. Documentation and record. There has to be clear documentation and record maintained for all the transaction. <clears throat> so for control environment, we need the following conditions. We have to have a management that has the right philosophy and the mindset and the role modeling. They're setting the example that CEO will not bypass authority. Procedure, sometime you'll see management, what they do, uh, they want to get something approved and they know they cannot get it approved through the right procedure. So what they will do, they will wait at the last minute then they will run straight to the CEO. Sir, you know, uh, time is passing. We're going to lose opportunity. Please sign off. And then the CEO, they start signing off on those documents. And that we have seen in many organizations happening, the bypassing the prop, uh, regular control. That becomes a major headache. Every time, everything is a crisis. That cannot be a uh, good management uh, philosophy. If that happens, your investigation is useless because everything you're going to find has the right authority or right by the CEO. Effective hiring is very, very critical. You make sure that you hire, do the background check and uh, the hire the right people, they investigate. Um, as I told you yesterday, I have seen um, hiring of a CTO, chief technology officer. The guy's salary was close to $100,000 per month and his certificates were fake. He even, his bachelor degree, master's degree, PhD, all from online universities. If he says in the CV, uh, he graduated from company, university ABC, his actual certificate says CDE. Okay, when we check on his experience, uh, the company that he said he worked for, that company's letterhead is very different from the letterhead he submitted. The address, when we called them, they did not know anything about him. 
but that checks and balance should have happened before the hiring not after the hiring okay clear organization structure the more and the, the clarity on the organization structure that is the better environment then you know who's reporting to whom but if an organization that organization structure like accordion it goes in and out every month changes every quarter or every year that's not the right environment for uh, that's not the right control environment and also you have to have it properly trained with proper authority uh, internal audit team they must be independent if they're not independent you're not going to get it you have to have proper accounting system in place that validates transaction there's authorization process transactions are complete they're they're classified properly the timing is managed properly and they are summarized properly and there has to be segregation of duties proper procedure for authorization it should not be today like i have worked for an organization where um when i one one day went to get some uh, approved they said okay i need four signature no reason why they need four signatures month later for the same transaction they were like no we need five signatures i'm like why do you need five signatures now they hear like oh i saw a document last week that had five signatures on it okay so that's not a organ that's not how an organization to work there should be clear procedure policies in place it should not be what i think it should be what's in the paper uh, there should be adequate documents and records maintained and there should be physical control over assets and records access control and everything should be there physical control you know usually you have a swipe in and out into the office uh, there should be cctv camera and uh, there should be timing like some organization i know uh, on after a certain time you need to uh, leave the car office <coughs> excuse me or is going to be locked out you have to call the security to get out of it um and independent checks and balances there has to be some way for somebody to go and independently check your transaction now come to the most uh, interesting uh, part of it the rationalization any idea what is rationalization it's about justifying why you are going to do the fraud they owe it to me my salary should have been more for similar position company a is giving 20% more and i have been working in this company for 20 years they are not giving me anything so that is one i only i'm only borrowing the money this i have heard many times did the investigation oh no 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 i was just taking it home and i'll come back and give it back to you next day i have heard it so many times they were not stealing they are borrowing <clears throat> nobody will get hurt this is another thing i heard a lot that they were stealing overcharging customer their thought is well i'm not hurting the company the company is getting its money i'm getting my money where is the problem here well you're stealing from the customer you're stealing from the company's customer i deserve more uh, is for a good cause like barney ebers uh, he was donating a lot to the uh, charity to the church um, so you know he was thinking that he's doing good thing good job is creating job for other people also we'll fix the book as soon as we get past this little financial problem this is usually happening in the lapping section lapping or kiting so you keep taking the money you putting it back from the other money and keep on going and you think that you're going to pay it back someday and the money keeps uh, snowballing you never have time because the amount keeps on growing i is only for my sick child i have seen that also uh, one case the cfo's uh, wife was critically ill and uh, that was one of his motivation for uh, uh, committing the fraud okay that's all for today um, i think it's almost an hour and 15 minutes thank you very much for your patience um, i i had two comments yesterday one is uh, we should have more time for question and answer and also slow down a bit i hope 
I was not too fast today. Um, about tomorrow, the final session on introduction to fraud, we will talk about fighting fraud. Maimun, this is what you wanted to, Maimun and uh, Tai, you wanted to know about uh, how to fight fraud, put the controls in. That will be a discussion for tomorrow. Um, we'll become familiar with different ways the organization can fight fraud, understand the importance of fraud prevention, understand how to create culture of honesty and high ethics, understand why hiring the right kind of employees can greatly reduce the risk of fraud, and how to assess, mitigate the risk of fraud, know different ways to investigate fraud, be familiar with legal action to take once fraud is discovered. So again, I told you, <clears throat> this type of discussion, there will be a lot of repetitive uh, discussion also. This is to emphasize uh, the need for those areas uh, and uh, uh, you know, to make, it, make you understand, appreciate uh, the concept that goes behind mm -hmm. fighting fraud. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now the floor is open for questions. Uh, uh, may, I, may, may I ask? May I ask a question, please? Sure. Uh, yeah. Why my video cam is kept off during this you know, session? Uh, because I don't want to have uh, too many, uh, uh, too much bandwidth taken. Because that will slow down. Uh, okay. Okay. I got you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. And then the second. Okay. I will question that later. Just proceed on. Thank you. Any other questions? No, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. It was a very informative session. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It was uh, very learned. Thank you. <clears throat> you I will, uh, yes, Tai, go ahead, please. Uh, any question? Okay. Um, I will have this uh, um, recording uploaded on our um, YouTube. Uh, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, please do post your comments what you like, what you do not like, and what you want to see in the future. Okay? Okay. Um, thank you very much for your time and hope to see you tomorrow again. Okay, thank you. Okay. Have a good day. Stay safe, stay tomorrow. home, stay positive, and keep smiling. Okay? Thank you, thank thank you, you very, very much. much. Welcome. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.